This piece of The Hellraiser franchise originally created by Clive Barker as a book, or more accurately, a novella, was adapted into a full feature length film in 1987 by Clive Barker himself, bringing to life one of the most iconic horror faces in history, Pinhead, or as he was just known at the time, Lead Cenobite. And from there, the franchise has spawned nine different sequels where it's still kicking and breathing today, having a brand new reboot set to come out on Hulu that is going to look a little bit more faithful to Clive Barker's original work. It's a series that I think isn't for all horror fans out there as it is very brutal and gory and some of the ways you wouldn't expect also being very erotic. And well with the brand new movie I thought it'd be best to celebrate by going back to all the previous 10 movies we have gotten thus far telling you my opinion on what I think of this bonkers wild and at times really dull franchise. Because I'll just say it right now over the years I've tried several different times to get through the Hellraiser franchise always stopping one or two movies in tapping now and going not for me then I don't know what happened I clockwork orange myself sat down forced myself to sit through the entire 10 movies and count me now as a giant fan of pinhead and this world. But I am going to be doing things a little bit differently because the Hellraiser franchise has over 10 movies, a lot of them extremely violent, unforgiving, and so much freaking nudity. If I did my usual thing of devoting one video review to every single film in this franchise, I'd be constantly getting hit with demonetization after demonetization. That along with later on in the series, as the movies start to get really horrendous, they repeat the same mistakes over and over. Having me come to the conclusion, it'll be a lot easier and better for you guys if I divide it into three videos covering the first four Hellraiser movies in this video then covering five through seven the next and ending off with eight through ten getting you all ready and prepared for the brand new movie so as we go through these set of sequels I want to know from you guys where do you stand on the Hellraiser franchise were you always a fan of them did it take a while for you to get into them or are you someone who was like me for the longest time that was like I just I, do, I don't get it it's cool but I just don't get it either way let's hit play on the first Hellraiser movie from 1987 directed by Clive Barker. We begin the movie with the character of Frank Cotton who decides to purchase the puzzle box from a merchant in a foreign country. Frank Cotton is someone who partakes in all pleasures of the world so much so that he's run out of pleasures on earth and is now seeking out otherworldly sensations to take him beyond points of pleasure. Sorry, no refunds. After some time, we find Frank's brother Larry Con and his wife have inherited the house he's left behind, ready to fill it with some family memories, unaware of some of the sick things that went on in this house. Right here is why I want to stop and talk about, I find it so interesting that Clive Barker both wrote the original novella for Hellraiser and then made some drastic changes when he decided to write and direct the actual feature length film. Some minor and some major changes like in the original novella called The Hellbound Heart, his brother was named Rory instead of Larry. Also, Larry did not have a daughter, but instead a friend in his life that wanted to be with him, but he was already married. In the film, they instead chose to make that Kirsty's role as the daughter to Larry. Even Pinhead himself was described to have more female-like qualities, but for the movie, Clive Barker made him a man, handing off the role to his childhood best friend, Doug Bradley. A choice I think really paid off for the both of them. To me, some of the more crazier and really gross changes come when the plot kicks in. Because we find out Julia, the wife of Larry, actually once had an affair with the brother Frank. You're gonna let me kiss the bride. And let me tell you, as a Hispanic, now I understand why this was a novela originally. Televisa presenta. I 
I see the soap opera vibes. But while moving into the home, Larry accidentally cuts himself on a nail, walks into the room that Frank opened the puzzle box and sent himself to hell, dripping blood on the floor and beginning the process for his brother Frank to be able to come back to life in some amazing special effects. That's one of the things I grew to love as watching the Hellraiser franchise is some of the attention to detail with the visual effects. It's stuff that is rarely done today in the modern age and when it's done well, an old movie like Hellraiser can still not only give you the creeps but impress you visually. But this was also another major difference from the book. Originally, Frank, when he opened the puzzle box, it opened up his sensations in his mind, over flooded him with pleasures that he started yanking out his eggplant, rubbing it till frosting hit the floor, died, and then later on when his brother Larry would bleed on the floor, it would mix with his frosting and that would be one of the things to bring him back to life. Yeah, I'm kind of glad they made that change. That's weird, all right? That's like a couple steps away from making a baby with your brother. Good change, Clive Barker. But as the movie continues on, we see Julia comes across the body of her ex-lover, Frank, who is barely brought back to life. Julia, don't look at me. And this is where I was thinking, Frank must have been packing and know how to deliver that package because he convinces Julia that in order to make him whole once again and for them to be together is to bring him more blood as it'll help him resurrect and get his body back. Doing exactly that, Julia puts herself in positions where she attracts men to bring him home only to make them sacrifices for Frank. And this is where I was really starting to get into the movie, but I was also thinking, what the heck, why is Kirsty considered the main character and why does everybody just talk about Pinhead? They seem to be like the least important part of this movie. And I'm not even really saying that as a negative, I'm just talking about legacy because so far, Hellraiser is just one effed up love story showing how far some are willing to go just for the desires of love and pleasure. I swear, these cannot be the same movies I tried watching as a kid and turned off 20 minutes in because I just didn't know what the heck was going on and was wondering, Where's the white dude with the nails? Now Frank does eventually go on to explain what happened to him when he opened up the box, got sent to hell, and was being tortured by the Cenobites. The Cenobites gave me an experience beyond the limits. Pain and pleasure. Indivisible. They won't get me back. I'm going to live and you're going to help me, yes? Yes. Mentioning to Julia the last thing he needs to be complete is just some skin to wear and then he'll be normal. This is where I say Kirsty finally comes into play in the movie because all this time she seemed like a one-off side character catching on to Julia acting weird, even going as far as seeing her bring another man to the house. Kirsty thinking she's about to catch Julia cheating on her father, instead coming across Uncle Frank who does not look at all like she remembers. Kirsty, it's Frank. It's Uncle Frank. No. You remember. No. Come to daddy. Kirsty manages to escape with the puzzle box, ending up in the hospital, messing with the puzzle box, and finding a gateway into hell. And here's one of the common complaints I'll have through the Hellraiser franchise is that that cube is very pick and choosy to what happens to the people who solve that box. Sometimes I think it's a real roll of the dice whether you solve the box and chains will immediately come out and start mutilating you, or in Kirsty's case, just finding a gateway way opening up to hell itself. That along with also as the series continues on, I do not sense any sort of struggle for someone to try and open the box. It feels like you just rub it around for a little bit and it'll open for you. For something that is referred to as a puzzle box, doesn't really feel like much of a puzzle to open. But now that Kirsty has opened the gateway to hell, she encounters so many beings with amazing practical effects. Another thing I've come to love about the Hellraiser franchise is the design with some of these Cenobites. You have the engineer here that just looks like some weird messed up skin banana. Then you have Chatterer who does this with his teeth. <laughs> Someone go get this guy a sweater. One gelatinous looking blob named Butterball that is just licking his lips. Another one that is just known as the female. Fun fact, she was originally supposed to be named Deep Throat. Wonder why they changed it. But hey, if that's the name she's got, she must have earned it, right? Open this. How do I open this? How do I get this open? And the one that is known as the Hell Priest slash lead Cenobite that the fans have just named Pinhead. Demons to some. <laughs> 
angels to others. Kirsty manages to make a deal with them saying that she can bring back the person that has escaped them, Frank, if they let her go. And this to me is where the movie just took it to all different levels of effed upness. First, Kirsty comes home and thinks she has found Frank dead on the floor, fearing that her deal is now no longer valid, but it's worse than she thought because Frank has actually killed her father and taken his skin. Also, even though Julia was doing all this for the love of her life, Frank stabs her. Not even a little bit remorseful for what he did, and I kind of feel bad for Julia here, even though she crazy. But since Frank is alive, Kirsty is able to fulfill her promise of delivering him to Pinhead, having him pay the price for having escaped their hands in a really, really gruesome death. I just know this video is getting demonetized. Please, YouTube gods, help me here. Sadly, it looks like Pinhead isn't a man of his word, because he still wants Kirsty to be tortured for all eternity, leading us to what I think is kind of a weak ending, just Kirsty rubbing around the puzzle box and making it so the Cenobites are destroyed. It is kind of a lackluster way to end the movie and I kind of had a bit of integrity for Pinhead for making deals, so it's kind of a bummer the movie didn't fall through with that, but I will give it props for ending this specific way with them trying to burn the puzzle box only for a demon skull to pick it up and take it away, having the cycle repeat again where someone else is buying the puzzle box. Even with some of my nitpicks and gripes, overall, super enjoy Hellraiser. It's a movie I'm so glad that I eventually gave another chance to. And sometimes you just gotta watch a movie a different period in your life for you to appreciate it. It is just kind of funny to me that the legacy and the things people remember most from these movies is Pinhead and Kirsty. when I really will argue they're the least interesting aspect of this movie and I was so much more fascinated with the messed up love story between Frank and Julia. Your suffering will be legendary even in hell. Hellbound. Hellraiser 2, time to play. Premiering only a year later in 1988, it takes sort of a Halloween 2 approach where it takes place immediately after the events of the first movie, not just that, but also having a hospital backdrop as its main setting. Sadly, Clive Barker would not return to direct this movie, but it would not suffer in quality as some people prefer Hellraiser 2 over the first movie. And while I'm someone who still prefers the first movie, this second film did so much for Hellraiser in expanding the lore, showing off what you can do in this universe by focusing a little bit more on the Cenobites, taking you into that underground hell world. I don't blame anybody for making this their favorite Hellraiser movie, so without further ado, let's hit play with Hellraiser 2 Hellbound. The beginning of the movie starts off with a long montage to the way the first film ended. From there, it brings us to an opening of a man who's trying to solve the puzzle box, revealing to the audience this is actually the origin of the lead Cenobite, Pinhead. And let me tell you, it is one gruesome transformation scene that I'm happy was included without giving away too much on the background of our lead horror icon. <laughs> We cut then to Kirsty, who is now laying in the hospital, even though at the end of the last movie, she was perfectly fine with her boyfriend burning up the puzzle box. Still, she's being questioned on the events of the first movie with her dad dead and Julia missing. To me, the funniest part about all this is while this is happening and she's being interrogated, she's like, what happened to my boyfriend? He was just with me at the end of the last movie. Huh, don't worry about him, he's okay. We sent him home hours ago. <laughs> Oh, uh, he dipped. But Hellraiser 2 introduces to a character I just find so fascinating, Dr. Shenard. This is a man who works at the hospital, but actually has a secret double life because he's fascinated with everything involved with the puzzle box. He's done tons of research on it over the years, as far as to where he has three of them sitting in his office. And him finding out there's a connection with Kirsty and that puzzle box, he has the mattress that had one of the victims die on sent to his office. This is where we see him abusing his power and sending one of his more sick inmates who believes there are maggots all over him, handing him a switchblade and letting blood cover up the mattress that Julia lied in. This is some of the stuff I'm gonna have to censor heavily for this video, but Hellraiser 2 takes up the practical visual effects up a notch and it is all the more awesome and gruesome for it. But in sticking with the rules that was established in the first movie, the blood resurrects Julia, finally putting all the years of research this doctor has done on the puzzle box to good use. This is all 
also where I want to talk about what a smart decision I think it was to bring back the character of Julia and have her sort of be the new Frank for this movie. Because she is the one now that is requesting Dr. Shinar to bring her victims to be able to resurrect herself. But it also develops the character of Julia in a better way where she's not just a damsel being manipulated by Frank and instead is now her own strong independent character. Even if she's leaving blood all over this nice white house. I also want to say the effects on a bloody Julia look way better than they did on Frank in the first movie. The movie does though however break one of its own rules where instead of them having to get someone else's skin so that they can be complete, Dr. Chenard has brought her enough victims where Julia gets her original skin and I don't mind that, you want to bring back the original actress you just get her back. And I mentioned how I felt in the first movie, Kirsty didn't really feel like the main character, just someone who needed to be there to put a stop to all of it by the end. Here with Julia being the new antagonist, I feel it all also elevates Kirsty to have a better spot in this movie because she was someone that did not like her stepmother, creating what I think is this great energy between protagonist and antagonist. They changed the rules of the fairy tale. I'm no longer just the wicked stepmother. Now I'm the evil queen. Too bad Kirsty's not that big of a fighter and takes 100% damage with one bitch slap. Take your best shot, Snow White. <laughs> But now that Dr. Chenard has fulfilled his promise of helping Julia get her skin, Julia must now return the favor and reward him with all the pleasures that come with opening the box. Having the doctor abuse his power one more time, bringing in a patient who's just an expert at puzzle boxes, making it one of the very few Hellraiser movies to actually put an effort into opening the box instead of just rubbing it. And here I think is another reason to love Hellraiser 2 because we get to explore a little bit of this underworld hell. Like for one, the patient who solved the puzzle box, Tiffany, is sent to a section where it's just a circus town, creating some really creepy visuals, but what is essentially supposed to be her own personalized hell. Kirsty, when exploring the labyrinth, is brought into a room with photos of her mom, only to be reminded of her death and tragedy. This is an aspect of Hellraiser I wish they would have explored more in other sequels, but it'll be one of the only times we really spend with the labyrinth. But it's also where it introduces us to who's responsible for the Cenobites and everything going on here, and that is Leviathan. The god of flesh, hunger, and desire. Leviathan. This shape in the sky is what controls this underworld and is the commander of the Cenobites. Leading me to something else I love in this series is a Cenobite transformation. Dr. Chenard is put in this tube where he's converted from his human form into a Cenobite that not only looks extremely gruesome, involves him getting his blood replaced with some blue liquid, but most fun of all, whatever you did in the real world or human trait you had, that becomes your Cenobite personality. So with Dr. Chenard, him being a doctor in the real world, he gets doctor-like qualities as a Cenobite. Like his fingers get expanded out and become little medical devices, scalpels, bone saws, and don't even get me started on the doctor-related puns. The doctor is in. I recommend amputation. I'm taking over this operation. This is where Hellraiser started getting fun and creative. Some people think it's gimmicky and cheesy. I think it's fun and awesome and makes me want to see so many more different types of Cenobites. And well, let's just say part three takes it a step too far, but we're not there just yet. Because while exploring the labyrinth, we see a familiar character come back. Kirsty encounters her uncle, Frank. What I think is so funny about him coming back is we get to see what his personal hell is, and it's basically just almost naked women under a sheet that disappear once he tries to pull them back. This is my hell. They're here to tease me. They promise forever and never deliver. That's Frank's hell, that, all right then. Bringing us to the third act in the movie where when Julia encounters again, the Cenobites she's familiar with is able to defeat them by reminding them that they were all once human too, even though they have no memory at all of their previous life. This is kind of interesting where they try humanizing Pinhead and make him not so much the bad guy. I mean, here through this revelation, he goes as far as protecting Kirsty and Tiffany from Dr. Chenard that I guess wants the position of lead Cenobite, killing each one one by one revealing their human form, kind of explaining to us why they were turned into that Cenobite. Like with the female Cenobite, of course it would be a pretty female with Butterball. No one I think was surprised that it was someone on the heavier side. I was kind of shocked though when Chatterer turned into a little kid. And while a lot of these people, you can find their backstory through comic books that have been extended out, just going off the movie, I mean, kids talk a lot. Chatterer, 
you can put two and two together. Sadly, I do think this one suffers though from sort of a weak ending. One, cause Julia was killed off in such a funny, laughable way of her skin just peeling off. <laughs> I will give them props though for adding a unique twist since early on Julia's skin got peeled off, Kirsty had the brilliant idea to wear the skin and pretend to be Julia in order to distract Dr. Chenard. That's some Mission Impossible stuff right there. <laughs> Bringing the movie to a close where both Kirsty and Tiffany are able to check out from the hospital, begin their new life, as we cut to the same movers from the first movie taking all the things from Dr. Chenard's home, that is until the movers get a little too close to the mattress, leaving us with the pillar of death and a hint that more hell is yet to come. I really enjoyed Hellraiser 2 not only for its step up in its visual effects and gruesome kills, but because they decided to expand the world a little more, give us an insight to the Cenobites, how they're made, where they come from. These last two movies are what I consider to be actual great films that any horror fan should at least try once. But if these didn't do it for you, these next two, you don't need to see them. Cause things are about to get campy. It's so good to be back. Clive Barker presents Hellraiser 3. Hell on Earth. Hellraiser 3, Hell on Earth, released in 1992. By this time, the name Hellraiser and the look of Pinhead were very iconic in media. And we all know when you got some brand recognition, you gotta exploit that for some more movies. However, with the third one, they've made some major changes. Not only did their budget for the film get cut in half from the previous movie, they also decided to take a widely different approach into making the films. Instead of having Pinhead be a side character that shows up towards Towards the end, Doug Bradley's role as the lead Cenobite gets a lot more screen time. The series also becomes a lot less serious, jumping into campy territory with some horrendous acting. Most Hellraiser fans will tell you this is when the franchise started dipping in quality, but it's also where I tell you the fun went up times 10 because I kind of enjoy Hellraiser 3. Don't get me wrong, the issues and negatives involved with this film are glaringly obvious, but again, the camp and fun this movie presents, I have a blast with. I'll make it more clear to what exactly I mean, but for now, let's just go ahead and hit play with Hellraiser 3. Hell on Earth. Here we have the movie open up on a character named J.P. Monroe, who's an art salesman. He enters a gallery when he comes across the Pillar of Souls that we saw at the end of the last movie. Only this time, it looks a lot more fancier and like some art he can exploit and sell for a lot more than it's worth. This is then where we get introduced to the new main character in the movie, no longer Kirsty, but instead Joey, a reporter who's very sad right now because she's in the ER and no one's suffering and dying for her to exploit it on the news. My first geek that isn't kindergarten kids or diet gurus is taken away from me. Don't you just hate when that happens? Thankfully though, her prayers get answered and someone is rushed into the ER with chains all attached to them. This is also where we meet another main character for the movie, Terry, who was a witness that saw all of this happening and brought the guy to the hospital. Now let's not get too excited here. It's not like this guy's head's gonna explode and make such a great story for the news. Get the cameras rolling, get the cameras rolling. And that's essentially what kicks off the plot for this movie. The reporter is now obsessed with trying to figure out what happened to that patient. That wasn't normal. And to me, some of the stuff really works in here, while other stuff I think could have been done without. Like one thing I like, they semi try to follow the rules of the previous movies and make blood very important in trying to bring back someone to life. Cause at one point we see JP Monroe get bit by a rat and his blood spills on the pillar, awakening it. So that later on in the movie, the woman he took to his bedroom that is a superb actor Actress, let me tell you. And this is your club? Right again. Great club. I really love it here. Radical. Wow, you've got great taste. I can't fucking believe you. You bastard! <laughs> when she gets close to the pillar, we get one of the best death scenes in the movie. <laughs> Jesus Christ. Not quite. Creating that dynamic that we have seen in the previous two films where Pinhead promises J.P. Monroe, if you bring me more blood and victims, I could promise you not only power, but also make you my right hand man in hell. I also even like the relationship between the reporter Joey and the witness Terry. I even like some of these dramatic shots when they start talking about the puzzle box. I said it came out of this. 
Not a big fan of them doing this to a dog, though. Come on, Lily. <laughs> also do like in this movie that they have a cameo of Kirsty, the original actress from the first two movies, sort of like a Terminator 2 Sarah Connor style thing. But some of the things that don't exactly work for me that I feel kind of drag this movie along is for one, Joey, the main character, keeps having flashbacks to her dad in the war. It'd be fine if it was like one or two, but they are consistent and all throughout the film. They feel very useless until you find out that this movie is trying to create two different sides of Pinhead. We have his Cenobite form and his human form that we now know is named Captain Elliot Spencer. Essentially, the events of the second movie caused it so that his good half is out there trying to stop his evil half. It even gives us a little bit of an explanation to why he was seeking out the lament configuration and trying to solve the puzzle box. The war destroyed my generation. I went further. I was an explorer of forbidden pleasures. I like the idea of Doug Bradley's human form coming in here and having a bit of a role, but I just feel this execution didn't work. Still, even with those things like the bad acting, the war flashbacks, the not great execution of human pinhead, the thing that keeps this movie to an absolute crazy fun level to me are the kills and what they do with the Cenobites. After a bit of a falling out with Joey, we see Terry run back to her art salesman boyfriend, J.P. Monroe, who at this point in time is just trying to get as many souls as he can for the pillar yes i just i want to hug you you know i want to hold you i want to tell you it's all right no 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 baby it's better that you come to me his attempt though is completely failed and actually becomes one of the victims for the pillar getting gruesomely attacked by a couple of pistons to the head but this was the final fuel pinhead needed to escape the pillar and fulfill what the title says pinhead bringing hell on earth shall we begin here we just see absolute insanity to the people attending the nightclub with just some really fast yet satisfying kills. An ice pick to the mouth, the bartender getting covered in barbed wire, the DJ getting brutalized by a couple of CDs. I think it's quite a horrific scene and just shows you some of the power Pinhead has when he unleashes it on a group of people. Here though is where Joey the reporter witnesses the attack on the nightclub, calls up her cameraman and says, you need to meet me there, giving us the audience a look that her TV isn't even plugged in and this is a trap by Pinhead. And when we have Joey the Reporter witness the aftermath of everything Pinhead did, it should be something gruesome and terrifying to us, but it really just comes off more campy and a little bit goofy. Cause you have eyeballs in martini cups, a couple of victims on a pool table with just balls in their mouth. It might not really be terrifying, but as a horror fan who enjoys good practical effects, I appreciate the effort, especially this shot of her cameraman getting his head replaced with a camera. I do, however, wish though they would keep the intensity in the voice behind Pinhead because I think you can hear a difference from what he sounds like here and what he was like in the previous movies. We want the man who did this. Just come here and die while you still have the option of doing it quickly. But this does bring us to what I think is the most controversial part of Hellraiser 3 Hell on Earth is what they do with the other Cenobites. We saw in the previous two movie, they essentially killed the most iconic ones or the ones that were first introduced, Chatterer, Butterball, the female Cenobite. So Pinhead needs some new followers to continue on his murder spree, choosing a couple of victims from the nightclub, one of them being Joey's cameraman that gets a camera implanted in his head and just like with Dr. Shenard the boy is filled with puns ready for your close-up Joey that's a wrap oh and he ain't even the most ridiculous Cenobite that's introduced here the DJ that was attacked by CDs he gets turned into CD a Cenobite with literal CDs in his head and even throw some like shooting ninja stars and I am not joking or trying to be funny I think this is awesome like Come on, a CD Cenobite that has a CD player to throw out CDs? Sure, it's dated, but I think it's fun. That is so cool to me and is exactly what I meant by I just want crazy fun Cenobites in every Hellraiser movie. Like even here, the bartender walks around with a damn shaker. Also, the official name of this Cenobite is Barbie. And I guess that just plays into the pun that he was a bartender, but he's covered in barbed wire. Oh, and did I mention the boy's also a human flamethrower? This is fun, this is cool. I know there's fans who hate the idea that Hellraiser 3 turned Pinhead and the Cenobites into slasher characters, cause that's not what they're supposed to be, but I would watch an entire movie of these Cenobites walking around and just killing people with their silly little abilities. Even at this point, I think the movie has fun in itself. I mean, just take a look at this line. Demons, demons aren't real. 
They're parables, metaphors. Then what the fuck is that? The laughter I had in my living room watching this for the first time. Why did no one tell me this is what the Hellraiser movies were like? Now as we get towards the end of Hellraiser 3, I will admit the last two Cenobites they added are pretty dumb. Like J.P. Monroe, the art salesman, he gets turned into the Cenobite with the pinstons in his head. I'm assuming because he drives a cool car so he gets a car piece in his head. Not that creative or fun. Then Terry, the character we were almost following all this movie, is told her only unique trait is that she's constantly smoking, so she gets a cigarette implanted in her neck. Now that design looks ridiculous. If you're someone who literally thinks the CD design looks worse than her just having a cigarette at her neck, Get out of here. And to make matters more silly, her ability is just literally stinging you with the cigarette bud around your body. Like, yeah, that would hurt, but that'd be more of an annoyance and not something Cinnabite level of torture. But it does make me wonder, man, what would I look like as a Cinnabite? My thing is, I'm a YouTuber, so like, my head would become a giant play button made out of flesh. I'm addicted to collecting Funko Pops, so you can give me those weird soulless Funko eyes, and let's just add in a mouth so I can talk. A giant flesh-like button hand to smash you with, and my ultimate weapon, a razor-sharp red subscribe button to slice you with. <laughs> Having the movie end in just a super repetitive way, her messing with the box in some sort of fashion that sends the Cenobites back to hell, not before the good and evil side of Pinhead merge back together, then get sent away permanently. Having the reporter Joey melt the box in wet cement, the foundation to where a new building is being constructed, ending the movie off with the architecture of that building being very reminiscent to the Lament configuration. And again, like I said, I understand Hellraiser 3 really dips in quality. It does not have a lot of the strengths that the previous two movies did, but if every sequel turned out to be as fun as this movie, or oh, you can bet Hellraiser would have been higher on my list on favorite horror franchises, but none of the other sequels really go the fun factor. This will kind of be one of the only campy slash silly movies in the series, and from what I found as I continued on with the series, I was yearning for more movies like this that just had fun within the world instead of just being gloomy and serious. Welcome to Oblivion, Hellraiser, <laughs> Bloodline. Hellraiser 4 Bloodline, releasing in 1996, directed by Alan Smithy, who if you didn't know, is a fake name directors give to movies when they don't want to be credited for their work. That right there should kind of tell you where we're at with this movie. Now, special effects technician Kevin Yeager, who worked on Freddy Krueger's makeup, Chucky, the Crypt Keeper, is the one that originally directed the movie, but because of so many studio rewrites and several changes made to the film, it just didn't turn out to be the movie he initially wanted. And with Hellraiser 4 Bloodline, this is essentially the one where Hellraiser goes to space, joining the likes of Leprechaun, Jason, and the Fast and Furious franchise. We're not a space! Having your film franchise that eventually ends up in space, I think is something to be very proud of. This would also mark the last time a Hellraiser movie was released theatrically, as every sequel from here on out will be released straight to DVD. So in a weird way, this is the end of an era, and to me, this is also the last really enjoyable Hellraiser film. While this one still has a lot of glaring flaws, and doesn't meet the quality of the first two movies, it does drop the campy factor of the third movie and try to take things a little bit more seriously where they expand the lore in a very unique way by essentially giving us three different movies in one set in different time periods exploring the origin of the puzzle box. So let's hit play on Hellraiser 4. Bloodline. The movie opens up on a space station in the year 2127. We meet Dr. Paul Merchant, who's using a robot to be able to open the puzzle box safely. Pretty smart, I might add, if you're from the future. Sadly, before we can see what he's up to, his spaceship is invaded by a couple of space police. Where's your crew? I made them leave. They're headed for Earth. Look, time is of the essence. Yes, time is of the essence. So what does he decide to do? Centuries ago, a man, an ancestor of mine, Tell the police officer a thousand year old story about what exactly he's doing here. And this essentially is how the rest of the movie goes. He'll tell us generation by generation how his family connects to the puzzle box as we go through different settings. A real ambitious story idea that I am all on board with concept wise, but I do think the execution is fumbled a bit. The first part of his story takes us back to France, 1796, where we meet one of the ancestors of Paul named Philippe Le Marchand, a French toy maker that was tasked with creating the 
the lament configuration. And Philippe is actually your typical nice Frenchman. He's got a wife, a kid on the way, a toy maker capable of creating a portal to hell with just some wood and metal. Normal. Philippe is excited and curious to figure out what exactly his puzzle box does, handing it off personally to his client, a father and son, the son, played by a young Adam Scott. And to me, I always get a kick out of seeing an actor we know today in one of their very first roles, like the boy is about to play Uncle Ben in a Sony movie. That's how I determine how famous you got. Did you end up in a superhero film? Well, that's awesome. Philippe didn't get the answers he desired, so he sticks around to snoop around the property and witness exactly what they plan to do with this puzzle box, and that is sacrifice a local woman to open the portal to hell. This is where we get introduced to the princess of hell, Angelique, that I actually think is a great character that is done so dirty in this movie. It's also yet another thing this puzzle box does without any instructions. You either get chains, open a portal, or a sexy demon to command. You gonna take the risk? I am. Philippe realizes what he created is no good to this earth and starts coming up quickly with a way to trap and put an end to this portal to hell. Sadly though, his attempt is unsuccessful and ends up getting killed by Adam Scott and worse, is given a curse to be forever connected to the Lament configuration. And like I said, as a kid, trying to check out the space version of Hellraiser, as soon as they went to the year 1706 in France, I checked out this time. I think that's a pretty interesting origin story. This then brings us to what was current day at the time, 1996, where we meet John Merchant, who's an architect that had just finished building a skyscraper in Manhattan that really resembles the Lament configuration and is actually the building that was teased at the end of Hellraiser 3. And honestly, say what you will about Bloodline in part four, but this is kind of why I really enjoy it. I love how connected it is to all the previous Hellraiser movies. It ties in the building to Hellraiser 3, giving us the answer to those questions but also works as both a prequel, a sequel, and a finale for the franchise. We see here though Angelique is still being held prisoner to this day with an immortal Adam Scott, but once she finds out that the bloodline of the toy maker is still ongoing, she feels determined to go after him, and since Adam Scott's character had no interest to go after the toy maker, he broke the only rule he needed in keeping a demon was not interfere with Hell's plan. And here's where to me things get even more interesting, because once Angelique travels to the US, finds the lament configuration, that was buried under cement and gets an unsuspecting victim to open the puzzle box, she comes face to face with Pinhead, the lead Cinnabite, and is actually confused to what she is witnessing. Things seem to have changed. Hell is more ordered since your time. Princess. Pinhead is very much aware of who Angelique is as the Princess of Hell. I guess you get some homework once you become lead Cinnabite of the Leviathan. But what's even more funny to me is that Angelique looks at him and goes, whoa, like things have changed. Think about that. Hell goes through phases and trends where if you vote for the wrong person down there, you could turn into this. And that's always been an interesting part of Hellraiser that's never been explored. That even though they talk about all eternity, they'll torture you and do all this, they haven't even been doing that for all eternity down there and things have changed in the last couple hundred years since Angelique was down there. But it is because of this sort of political difference that Pinhead and Angelique have, they start to butt heads. You are no different from that beast that sucks the bones you throw to it. This kind of in a weird way almost turns a demon like Angelique a bit sympathetic because she's about to get bullied by Pinhead. While Angelique and Pinhead are having this debate on how to handle things, we find two security guards in the building having a very interesting conversation. What I do with a woman that used to be a man? So what'd you say? I mean, I, I guess so, if she was cutting all. All right, Hellraiser 4, progressive and woke. I like it. Fun fact also, apparently these two twins in real life have a YouTube channel to this day based on home improvement. Go give them some likes. But the security guard officers are inspecting a room they've never seen before in the building, leading to something I love to see in the Hellraiser franchise, a Cinnabite transformation. Gentlemen, I am pain. And oh, this is a gruesome one. Again, sticking with the themes of creating Cinnabites, you have to make them into whatever personality trait they have as human form. And well, they're twin brothers with an unbreakable bond, so let's start giving them a bond that's unbreakable and fusing them together like they were Laffy Taffy. And this will be one of the last times we get to see a cool Cinnabite transformation because it doesn't happen for a very long time in these sequels. And well, since John Merchant is a descendant that's coming very close to figuring out how to make a reverse puzzle box to lock the portal to hell, Pinhead and the Cinnabites begin kidnapping his family in order to stop him. They even go as far as to introduce an animal Cinnabite with chatter-like qualities. 
Somebody go get that dog a sweater. Another cool thing that was added on. We knew humans could become Cenobites, but now you're telling me my puppy can't do? Where are you, Noah? All right, let me just figure out this puzzle box. And you're going to get a nice leather outfit, my boy. This is going to be so cool. Jokes aside, though, that's what I think every Hellraiser movie should do, is add on to the lore, add little details here that just expand it further, knowing now pets can also become Cenobites adds a new layer to things for me. Sadly, this version of the timeline ends like a lot of the movies do, with someone just holding the puzzle box up to Pinhead and the Cenobites, and they disappear somehow. That is, not before killing John Merchant and continuing the curse of the bloodline through his son. Finally bringing the story full circle to the year 2127 in space, where Dr. Paul Merchant is trying to put an end once and for all to Pinhead and this portal to hell. One thing you'll quickly notice though is in this future is Angelique has become a Cenobite. That's even more crazy because we just thought humans were turned into Cenobites. Now demons themselves can also be Cenobited? Kind of wild. I will say I don't know if I love that idea because it kind of just put an end to the conflict Angelique and Pinhead were having. Now that she's become Cenobited, she kind of forgot all those previous memories, the same a human would, and is now just another servant follower when she was the princess of hell. There's some comics in the Pinhead world talking about Cenobites rebelling against Leviathan and wanting to fight back, having almost a revolution. Angelique could have been perfectly fit for that kind of story but we'll never really get to see something like that. But at least we get some cool kills with the space cops dying off one by one. Probably the craziest kills when the twin Cenobites try becoming triplets and take care of this guy. Also, quick question for my horror fans and pet lovers. We hate whenever pets get killed in horror movies. What about when they're a Cenobite pet? Does that count? Does it? Bringing us all to a final showdown with Dr. Paul Merchant facing off against Pinhead, only he's pulling a Loki because he's not actually there. And I cannot tell you how much I started laughing at the confused face Pinhead had once he disappeared. It'll remain one of the funniest faces Doug Bradley ever did with Pinhead. Finally doing what his bloodline was always meant to do, completing the portal that shuts the gateway to hell and putting an end to Pinhead and the Cenobites. And yeah, with Hellraiser bloodline, it has its faults for sure, but it's not the most ridiculous take on taking a horror icon to space. If anything, it makes the most sense in my opinion. I also really ended up loving the character of Angelique until they they just completely forgot about her by the end. The origin of the Lament configuration was interesting enough. This works well as a beginning, middle, and end for the franchise to where this could still be the definitive end for Pinhead as the remaining sequels all basically take place between the 1996 story and the space story. And to really recap these past four movies, these ones that got theatrical releases are really the only Hellraiser movies I ever need and the ones I suggest you should ever watch. They have a connectivity to them that I think will be sad satisfying for fans. They also do enough to expand the lore in the world to keep things interesting with some creative kills, unique Cenobites, and at least an attempt to keep the story flowing in a way that's interesting. It is because I finally forced myself to watch these first four movies in completion back to back that I'm now a really big fan of this character. For years I always said Pinhead is cool but I don't get the hype around him and now I do. There are so many things to love in this world and I see the immense potential in stories you could tell that I can't believe some of these sequels just did not know what to do with Pinhead. But that is just my opinion on the first four movies. I want to know from you guys. We'll be continuing on here talking about five, six, and seven pretty soon. So make sure you're subscribed. Looking forward to those. But as always, my name is Chris. Take care.